Dr. Martin, out of a scientific and medical background, once believed in the theory of evolution. Evolution, as I was taught, uh, it all started with a thing called the Big Bang. They say this Big Bang went kaboom and shot out hydrogen gas, mostly, and the gas somehow turned to dust, and the dust condensed down into planet Earth. The evolutionists say it started dry, and then over millions of years, volcanic activity produced the water, and then in some little pond of this water somewhere on planet Earth, uh, these inorganic chemicals got together and they were zapped by some kind of x-ray or something else and all of a sudden you have this little speck of life and they say that was about three and a half billion years ago and then that little speck of life somehow over about three billion years became the first cell which was somewhere around 600 million years ago and then that progressively became beautiful you. Dr. Martin's traditional scientific background would go through an evolution, rather a revolution, as he joined the staff as a professor at Baylor Dental College. This was the beginning of the evolution of a creationist. And so in the fall of 1971, I went to Baylor in Dallas and gave my first lecture. It was on the evolution of the tooth. And I talked about how these fish scales gradually migrated into the mouth and became teeth. And a couple of my students came to me after class that day and said, Dr. Martin, have you ever investigated the claims of creation science? Well, that was 1971. I'd never even heard of it. At that point, I'd been a Christian for about five years. And uh, so I'm thinking to myself, where are these guys coming from? Uh, I've never heard of this. And uh, so I said, sure, I'll look into this with you. And I'm thinking, kind of as a cocky young professor, I'll blow these guys away. Well, they asked me to start studying the assumptions that the evolutionists make. And in all my years, eight years of scientific education, I had never had a single professor tell me about an assumption. And uh, so we started looking at the assumptions, and I began to realize they're making some claims here that really the assumptions aren't valid when they tell us rocks are very old and all these kinds of things. And, uh, and then they asked me to start studying some animals and see if I thought that animal could evolve. Well, the first thing that we really studied together was this little bug called a bombardier beetle. And this little insect, it's about a half inch long, and it mixes chemicals that explode. So I began to think, okay, now how would that evolve? So I think we've easily disposed of all three of our alleged difficulties, the eye, the wing, and camouflage. I'm going to end with a particular favorite of creationists, the notorious bombardier beetle. This is a recent headline that appeared in the Daily Telegraph, beetle that may explode the, the ideas of Darwin. Let's say if evolution is true, and you're evolving along here and you don't have a defense mechanism because that is the defense mechanism of the bug. So if evolution is true, it had to somehow evolve that. So let's say it's coming along here. Well, the first time it evolves the, the explosion, what does it do to the bug? Boom, you just splattered your bug, okay? So splattered bug pieces don't evolve. For Dawkins, if you could fry an egg on the top of his head. The telegraph thing goes on to say, if evolution were right, it would have exploded. The paper asks whether it offers proof of a creator. The story about the bombardier beetle is given in one creationist tract that I'm now going to read. The bombardier beetle squirts a lethal mixture of hydroquinone and hydrogen peroxide into the face of its enemy. These two chemicals, when mixed together, literally explode. In, in the face of the enemy. The chain of events that could have led to the evolution of such a complex, coordinated and subtle process is beyond biological explanation on a simple step-by-step -step process. The slightest alteration in the chemical balance would result immediately in a race of exploded beetles. <laughs> well now, this does sound like a bit of a challenge, a difficult case. I mustn't evade my responsibilities to take on difficult cases. Um, here we have some hydrogen peroxide and here's some hydroquinone and this is what's going to explode violently then. Right. Now anybody who wants to can leave the room. Right, we'll start with the hydrogen peroxide. So far so good. Now, I better put it down, didn't I? <laughs> Thank you.
happened. It's not even warm. Bit of a damp squib. There is some truth in the story. By the way, of course, I knew nothing would happen. He was never in any danger. <laughs> there is some truth in the story. Uh, in fact, the hydroquinone does nothing at all. We can put that on one side. The true story is that hydrogen peroxide on its own uh, does decompose to form uh, oxygen and water, but it needs a, a catalyst under normal conditions to, to do that. Um, this black powder here is a catalyst. It's not the catalyst that the bombardier beetle uses. The bombardier beetle does use a catalyst, and it does, in fact, squirt uh, this hot substance into the face of its enemy. But if you put a catalyst into a weak solution of hydrogen peroxide, then you're going to get a little bit of bubbling and it's a little bit warm. That might have some effect on the predator, that might slightly de deter a predator and uh, it would be um, not particularly dangerous to the beetle. Now we've got a smooth gradient, a bit more concentration of hydrogen peroxide and that's distinctly warm. That would work more effectively against a predator and by moving gradually up the slope gradually increasing the concentration of hydrogen peroxide we can end up with so there is a smooth slope all the way up to the effective deterrent against a predator the myth that the bombardier beetle or any other feature of the natural world that has yet been described cannot be explained by slow gradual evolution is a myth that deserves to go up in smoke <coughs> making a complicated organ in one fell swoop is equivalent to a miracle it's equivalent to opening a bank safe combination lock in a single lucky spin of the dial it cannot be done in one way or another, this lecture has been variations on the 747 theme. You can't make complex, efficient, working objects like eyes or wings in a single step. Any theory that says that life, or a part of life, an organ, an animal, complexity or perfection came into being in a single step, starting from nothing, has got to be wrong. Not only is it unscientific, it doesn't do justice to the grandeur of the universe. It's petty and small-minded. Evolution is the one idea that has nothing to fear from the 747 argument. Because evolution is the one idea that does not suggest that complex perfection came into being in a single step. It is the theory of miraculous creation that is really blown out of the water by the 747 argument. Because it is miraculous creation that is equivalent to cracking the safe in a single step, equivalent to blowing together a 747 in a junkyard. Evolution escapes the taint of miracle, escapes the taint of impossibly long odds by the simple yet hugely effective trick of smearing out the luck, smearing it out over the vastness of geological time. Harumph, 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 harumph. I didn't get a harumph out of that guy. Give the governor harumph. Harumph!
So I thought, well, how, how, how could this have happened? Well, it doesn't blow itself up. It has another little factory inside itself that manufactures chemicals, a chemical, acts as a catalyst, so that when you squirt that chemical in with these other chemicals that are like in neutral, you get your explosion. A chemical acts as a catalyst so that when you squirt that chemical in with these other chemicals that are like in neutral, you get your explosion. complexity or perfection came into being starting from nothing has got to be wrong. Well, the first time it manufactured that little chemical, it, it, here it goes again, blew itself up again. But it doesn't. Why? Well, because it has like an asbestos-lined firing chamber. And even then it would blow itself up if it didn't have somewhere for the explosion to go. So it has uh, like twin tail tubes. And it can aim these tail tubes all the way up, out the side, out the front. Let's say a spider is coming up toward its side and it doesn't have time to turn around and shoot. Uh, it can just take its little gun turret, and aim it out there and shoot. The, the explosion on this little bug, all you hear, if, if you're listening as a human, you hear this pop. But scientists have now put that explosion in slow motion and it's like, it's like about a thousand sequential little explosions but they're so fast, all we hear is one pop. And so you think, well now, why would that be? Well, that was a curious thing for the scientists that study this little bug. A lot of them at Cornell University, some other places. And what they discovered was that if it was just one big pop, the, the little bug, if he's shooting like a spider, let's say over here, uh, and he goes room, bang, and shoots it, he's gonna pop himself right out of there. It's like lighting a burner on a jet engine, and so he's out of there. But as long as it is a sequential explosion with his little legs, he can hang on. How would evolution explain a sequential explosion? This little bug messes with all the theories of evolution. There is no way a slow, gradual process is going to produce this bug. There's no way uh, even the newest theories of evolution, like punctuated equilibria, which means evolution happens very fast. Well, there's no way that will explain this little bug. I began to realize how could this particular little animal, for instance, evolve? Uh, it needed all of its parts, it needed everything there all at once, or you just don't have the animal. And my stomach started to churn, if, if I really want to be honest. And my wife would tell you, my stomach churned for five years. It took a five-year struggle for me to begin to flip the way I think, from thinking in an evolutionary way to thinking in more this animal or little creature, little bug, whatever, was created uh, fully formed, just like it is, because that went against everything I'd ever learned.